Um, okay, so uh, apologies in advance if I'm a little jet lagged, just because I got back Sunday night, and uh, when you're that much, when there's that much time difference, uh, for some reason the first day feels okay, and then the second day things start to digress, basically. So uh, if I start to pause and space out at any point. Just uh, blame it on the jet lag, okay? <laughs> Please. Um, but yeah, uh, you asked me about the conference. Conference was awesome. Uh, lots of good stuff that I think will feed into this class. Uh, obviously, sightseeing in Athens was pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, you've got history on display, basically, in the middle of the city with these archaeological sites that are thousands of years old. Um, and uh, Oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, this is the temple of Zeus here. Uh, and to give you some perspective, that little red line right there, that's a person. <laughs> so you get an idea of how tall these columns are. They're probably like four stories tall. That's that's a person right there, for those of you that weren't looking right. Um, and that's the Acropolis in the background, so the Parthenon is that, I think that one there. Um, this mountain kind of in the middle of the city, it's unreal, basically. Uh, but just to, I mean, I think I explained this, but maybe in case I didn't, uh, ICMC was the conference, uh, uh, International Computer Music Conference. Uh, it was actually a joint conference with sound and music computing, which is like the European um, equivalent of ICMC, so you've got the international convention on top of the European convention. Uh, the closest U.S. equivalent would be uh, what's called Seamus, S-E-A-M-U-S. Um, anyway, uh, awesome to, yeah, I was tweeting about it from my other Twitter handle, the one, the, the low-key NW, not the Prof Wallach one that you guys may have followed for this class, basically. So you, some of you that are following that other uh, Twitter handle may have seen some of my updates, but uh, this large picture over here, that's John Chowning uh, talking about his uh, personal history of how he got into computer music. Um, so, And it was awesome to hear him talk about reading Max Matthews' paper from Science Magazine like a few years after it came out. Um, uh, the, the part, the, the, per, the, let's see, he did a good job kind of uh, giving us a window into the personal history, the, the part that's like not in the history books because in history books it's like Chowning got this the software up and running on the computer at Stanford, basically. What he explained to us is that he was a timpani player in the Stanford Symphony Orchestra, um, and it was one of the other percussionists while they were, like, waiting out. Uh, those of you that don't know about uh, symphony literature, right, uh, the percussionists sit a lot of the time, uh, and he said, basically, because we were sitting a lot of the time, it's, it's then that one of the fellow percussionists, like, told me about Max Matthews' paper, which ended up totally changing my life uh, and got me into computer music. Uh, he said the tuba player, who the tuba players also sit quite a lot of the time, uh, was the programmer, was a programmer and I wasn't, and he knew how to get the software up and running on the PDP computer. So if it hadn't have been for all of us being in the symphony orchestra playing these instruments that sit in the back that don't play very much of the time, we might not have had time to chatter and, and work this out and, and get into computer music, which was like, Completely awesome to hear someone explain it from that from that perspective. Um, I got to talk to him a little bit afterwards and uh, just introduce him uh, myself. For those of you that don't know, my daughter also tagged along, so it was a kind of an it was a cool moment as a father to like introduce my daughter to these like, founding fathers of computer music, uh, uh, Chowning and Jean Claude Risset. Uh, didn't get to talk to Curtis Rhodes too much. He was kind of he gave his keynote and then wasn't seen too much around after that, basically, but. Um, but certainly the, the keynotes by Rizé and, and Chowning were two of the highlights for me, basically. A um, lot of cool projects that people are doing. Uh, I can uh, tell you more about those like in the context of things, but that, that was, that's kind of my conference in a nutshell, basically. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Any other questions you guys had? Or, like, <laughs> it's just, like I said, I, I'm like, I'm like, very full from this week of like hanging out with a bunch of top-notch computer music researchers from around the globe um, in this awesome uh, historical setting uh, talking about what we do basically so um, if I bowl you over with some new thing that I learned while I was uh, there sorry but uh, it was what now? Where did the 
potential duplication actually take place? Uh, uh, this was okay. So there. Yeah, they split their time. It was officially it was put on by the University of Athens, uh, but they didn't actually hold it on the campus. They actually uh, they booked out a movie theater <laughs> for the paper presentations. So I mean, uh, apparently their movies, uh, well, at least they weren't showing movies like in the morning, basically. So we were yeah. in there in the morning doing paper presentations, and then we would like vacate by about three, four in the afternoon, and they would then convert it back over to being a movie theater, and people were going to see the latest. Denzel Washington flick in the evening, basically. But right across the street from there was what's called the Onassis Cultural Center. It's this, like, two concert halls in a seven-story building, basically. So, like, the first four floors is the main concert hall, and then the, the, ne the next three floors is, like, the secondary concert hall, all in one building. It's a pretty awesome space. Um, that, this is the main concert hall here where John Chowning was giving his lecture, um, Talking about the, this, uh, getting into Max Matthews' uh, research, basically, but it was so it, the schedule was nuts. So like the papers would start at nine a.m., um, would be done by about four, and at four the concerts would start, and the concerts went literally from four p.m. to one a.m. Um, I didn't go to all the concerts because if you think about no. the time frame for that, basically, I mean, I dropped in and out to various con concerts. Uh, I did try to attend most of the paper sessions because that's more I'm more on the research end of the spectrum anyway. Uh, so I was interested in getting to know what people were, were doing you know, with different research threads, basically. But it literally, like, it, concerts from four to... I, actually, I had, I had a friend who had... So, let's see. So from four to nine are when concerts would happen at these main concert halls. But then from nine to one, there were, there were what are called the late-night concerts. They typically happen in a more... Uh, shall we say social venue with the bar at one end and you can kind of mingle and talk and it's it's not the, the you know the sit still quietly kind of repertoire it's more like we can talk and be social while music is happening kind of venue um, I had a friend who had the last piece on the late night concert and he said they went on at like 1 30 that night uh, so crazy schedule basically um, yeah, and then there were some evenings that in the main concert halls, they were using both concert halls at the same time. So there were concerts literally going on at the same time. Um, so it was impossible to see everything, it just by virtue of the fact that it went from 9 to 1 a.m. Um, and then you go to sleep and wake up and do it all over again the next day for five days straight, basically. That's just not, not humanly possible to take everything in. Um, yeah, you, you're tired at some point, and you're in Athens, and you want to go see some stuff, right? So, um, everybody kind of comes and goes as they as they need to, basically. But um, a very cool getting to meet, you know, uh, and talk to people that uh, let's see, so uh, literally some of the names that you guys were mentioning in papers, like John Chowning the week before. I was like uh, Xavier Rode was there. Um, uh, what are some other names that you guys dropped like last? Two weeks ago, that uh, basically various people that you guys were talking about, uh, uh, they were there and like I was rubbing shoulders with them, talking to them. So it was that was very cool. Um, and the I guess that points to the, the the discipline is young enough that like our founding fathers are like still around basically, um, and you can still meet them basically. They're in their 80s and 90s, but they're they're still around going to the, these conferences. So um, cool. Uh, so I wanted to kind of give you a report about that, basically, and give you some updates. Um, so checking in on what you guys are working on, right? Um, you should be done with tutorials about now. Uh, what did we set as a kind of a goal of about 50 of those tutorials? So hopefully you've, you've worked your way through those tutorials. Uh, that is the official tutorials. Uh, the reading reflections, uh, hopefully you saw the change and or got the tweet notification from me about... Uh, me restructuring some of the chapters, uh, and most of you have done the chapters, uh, readings, and responses, but uh, five and six, five was the one that was due last week, six is the one that's due this week, eight is the one that's due for next Monday, basically, so this, these should all feed into this next project uh, related to algorithmic composition, and we'll next week talk a little bit about networking and how getting computers to talk to one another, so you can actually have multiple computers uh, talking to one another and rendering your pieces in real time. Um, we're looking ahead to the algorithmic composition project. Uh, you will have new groups by the end of the day, so heads up on that. Okay, um, I, I intentionally put that at the end of my slides, not at the beginning of my slides, because I don't want that to. I, I want to get to some content uh, and then 
put you into groups and let you start talking, basically. Um, but the timeline is pretty tight, as it is with all of these projects. So annotated bibliography is for next Tuesday, so one week. Uh, I should be able to give you enough time to meet in your groups to start to divide up tasks and figure out who's doing what for those annotated bibliographies. Um, presentations then follow for uh, October 7th, which is actually two weeks from today. Um, this is the Tuesday before fall break, so they can't happen Thursday that week because there's no classes Thursday that week because it's fall break. So uh, we will have two projects in the books by the time we go on fall break, which is about where we where we need to be to kind of keep pace with things. Uh, again, these happen fast, and that's more or less by design to kind of keep momentum going, basically. Okay. Um, your synthesis presentations. I made copies of all the grading sheets so that I can give everybody a copy of their group uh, rubric filled out. These are group grades, so I, I believe I clarified this at the outset, but the grades are for the group and the group presentation, okay? So it's not like one person got one grade and another person got another grade. You, you all get the same grade as the group, okay? A um, couple of overall um, impressions that I had. Uh, one, most of the groups had words that were, or, excuse me, slides that were too wordy. I think that was a, a common trend that I noticed. Um, I'd like to kind of move you guys away from having all the words you're going to say on the slides, although no, not, not every, I don't think anybody was reading verbatim from slides uh, at any point, but um, try to get toward having bulleted lists that give you just kind of talking points rather than giving you uh, all the details on your slides. The other thing I noticed, and, and maybe this is my fault for not conveying this, but the idea that uh, because I gave you an area of my graph, didn't mean that you had to cover all the techniques mentioned in that quadrant. I'm pretty sure I said that. I have, I'd have to go back and look at the video to see if I explicitly said that. But the idea was that I was sending you in a, in a kind of area and you could pick one or two techniques to actually implement and talk about just those one or two techniques. So where some of your presentations kind of fell, uh, fell flat was that you were trying to cover like five different things, but you were only implementing one thing. And so it kind of diffused what you were talking about rather than focusing in on uh, just what you were implementing and talking about that one specific te technique. Maybe in the context of um, the, the larger umbrella uh, of the taxonomy that I put together. Um, so in the case of uh, like physical modeling, but you could talk about like Carpal Strong in the context of physical modeling but you didn't necessarily have to talk about all the other subtopics underneath physical modeling. I think every group tried to cover like all the topics and that was not my intent. My intent was that you would pick a topic, a technique, and fully flesh out that presentation on that topic. Okay, um, So that weighed on some of your grades, but not too much. I mean, I think uh, overall the grades were pretty good on these uh, from what I've seen as far as a first uh, presentation. Um, I don't know. Are there questions you guys have? I realize you've had like two seconds to read through your uh, rubrics, basically. But hopefully, the feedback as far as like what I've checked off on each row will help you improve as you go forward for pr uh, presentation two, three, and four. Okay. Um, are there any questions about those? Uh, particularly those two things that I've mentioned: uh, slides being too wordy and not intending for you to have to cover like everything under a subcategory. Okay, so hopefully those will clarify things going forward. Uh, if you're not happy with your grade, or even if you are happy with your grade, I'm offering you uh, a chance for three bonus points on this project. Okay, uh, I want you to go back and uh, it says listen to the recordings, but I guess you could watch the recordings because they're on YouTube, right? Uh, I believe I sent that link out yesterday after I got it posted. Um, you can re watch yourself giving a presentation, which I realize is torturous for some of you, but. Uh, Rewatch the presentation, 
look through the, rate, the rubric that was given, basically, and type up a 300-word reaction uh, to your own performance, basically, uh, in the presentation or your group's performance in the presentation. Uh, and if you do that, you get three bonus points. Some of you, this will help in terms of your grade on this project. Some of this, this might help you um, make up for a missed reading reflection, basically, somewhere down the line, okay? Uh, but I do think this is a valuable part of the uh, process of giving presentations is to go back and look at your presentations uh, and reflect on how you might improve going forward, basically. Um, I don't want this to linger too long, so can I give you a week deadline to do this? Next Tuesday. So by next Tuesday, yeah. Uh, and you just email this to me, and I'll reply back with a confirmation that, yes, it's been received, and I've recorded your... Uh, extra credit on this, okay? So in the next week, go back and watch your video recording, uh, write up a 300-word reaction, and email it to me, okay? Easy enough. Um, any questions about that? There's, there's not even a bullet list of like what you need to cover in your reflection, basically. I'm just looking for kind of you to reflect on what it is you did, how you're going to improve going forward, okay? Um, question I had for you guys um, about that. So I've put your video of your presentations up on YouTube. Uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but YouTube allows you to either list a video or unlist a video, which basically means that it's uh, it can either be unlisted or it can be public. I've left it unlisted for now um, just because I realize that some of you might not want people searching for your presentations on you your first presentation in computer music on YouTube. Um, I would eventually like to make it public just so that my playlist for the course is complete. Um, maybe I, I don't know what your, this is my uh, opportunity I'm giving you for comment on that basically of like, are you okay with those video, that video being public? I mean, I'll, technically I've already tweeted the link out so if people were paying attention they could follow it back and see the video even though it's unlisted. Unlisted basically just means people can't search for it. So if they're looking for Aiden computer music, it's not going to pop up, basically, because it's not in the search, basically. I don't know. What are your feelings about it being a public video versus being an unlisted video? You're, you don't care? You don't care? You guys are living your lives in public anyway, so the NSA is watching everything you do? Pretty much. <laughs> okay. I, I just wanted to give you a heads up before I made it public. Um, uh, yeah, if you if I don't hear from anybody by say this weekend, uh, I'll go ahead and go ahead and switch it from unlisted to public so that people can find it. Um, the other reason for that is that uh, I don't know. I sent out the link about the fact that I'm uh, posting these um, videos from this class, and Cycling Seventy Four actually retweeted that, and so there are some people that have. Uh, from the Cycling 74 uh, followers that are now following the course via YouTube, basically. I don't know how much they're getting out of it because so much of it is based on your individual research, basically, rather than me giving lectures, although there are some lecture topics that I've given, basically. Uh, and there will be some more in this unit, basically. Uh, but So there are some people following the YouTube playlist that are not here in this room, basically, because Cycling 74 tweeted out that link, basically. So, um, so somebody might try to understand physical modeling based on your exclamation explanation of it, Leo. So be aware of that, basically. I don't know if that, maybe think about that going forward as you're giving your future presentations, that it, it might not just be the people in this room trying to understand what it is you're talking about. Uh, and that could be a good thing for you, uh, developmentally. Um, okay, so. Uh, where to go from here? So we're talking about algorithmic composition, right? That's our next meta topic or broad category that we're looking at in terms of sound. Um, and I'm of a mixed mind in terms of how to handle uh, group divisions. And that, as I, as I kind of, and just so I'm clear, the, these charts that I have of like all the topics, this is like my tax taxonomy, my mind map is like in terms of like how I organize these topics in my head, okay? Um, so that's the reason why you had those four quadrants in synthesis, and some of those are based on readings that I've done, but some of those are based on my own organization of topics. Um, and so trying to organize this, uh, some of it, you, you'll notice some terminology that carries over from the reading that you guys did for this week, right? Um, but uh, there's not an easy subdivision where I can say, okay, your group is over here and your group is over there, except for maybe... 
this stochastic aleatoric chance up quadrant up here and this generative processes over here. But even then, there are some connections between these two quadrants. I'll give you that heads up, okay? Um, underlying both of those quadrants, though, is this idea of musical structures and how we are going to, um, how should we say, organize and deal with um, computer representations of these musical structures. That is, how do we talk about pulse and rhythm in terms of computer programming? How do we talk about pitch, pitch in terms of computer programming? Okay, And not just pitch, but pitch class sets, which I'll get to what that means. Some of you have gotten through theory four and you know what that means, basically. But some of you, this is going to be a new territory for some of you. Um, yeah, so I guess underneath these two kind of can't call them quadrants because there's not four of them, right? Because quad is four, right? So halves. Uh, halves, right? These two spheres of influence up here, okay? Musical structures and how those musical structures are uh, conveyed to the computer undergirds both of these areas, okay? And so I'm going to be focusing for the next two, maybe three classes on this part of the diagram and getting you set up so you understand how to do this so that you can then build algorithmic compositions. Does that make sense? So th this is where I'm focusing over the next week. This is where I'm expecting you to do your work for your research projects, okay? Uh, and there might be some bleed between the two where uh, I, I divided you in two groups this time, not three groups, not four groups. So there are actually going to be two larger groups this time. Um, and so you would think that I would just simply say, okay, you're in this half, you're in this half. But I'm going to kind of leave it fuzzy that you could migrate back and forth between these topics. But your goal is to take these synthesis uh, instruments that you just built and use them to uh, as the synthesis part of an algorithmic composition that you're now creating as a matrix patch that's talking to your synthesis in instrument. Okay, Does that make sense as far as where we're going with this? Okay, So it should build on what you did with project one. And that's also part of the reason for mingling the groups, is that if you take three different instruments and put them in one group together, you've got three different instruments you can pull from, and you might further refine them, but the, the goal is to build some sort of algorithmic engine that is creating a piece of music, or uh, maybe not necessarily a piece with a form, basically, but something that would generate music on the fly, basically, using computers. Okay. Um, and really, there's a reason for having these two different divisions in computer music. Part of it is, is historical. A lot of the early computer music research centered on synthesis and algorithmic composition. Okay, um, I mean, there's even some of the earliest computer music uh, examples are people rendering out scores that they then put in front of a string quartet that were created by computer. And those, are, that, even though the string quartet is playing the music, it's still considered computer music because the computer was crunching the score, basically. Okay. Um, does that make sense as far as where we're going? Okay. Are you ready for me to dive into this? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about counting rhythm. Okay. Because that's really where we need to start. Without before we have um, pitch, we have to have pulse, and uh, uh, for actually creating and organizing things in time. Okay. So we're going to make a very simple counter here. Okay. Um, and it's basically going to have this structure. Okay, so go ahead and if you don't already have Max open, please do so. I'm going to switch over here. I'm going to open up a nice blank patch. I'm going to put it in the middle of my screen. I'm going to increase the size. Okay. Um, so the first object you see here is uh, a toggle switch, right? You should know what a toggle switch is by now. Uh, you can get a toggle switch easily by using the T key on your keyboard. We're going to then connect that to a metro object. Specifically, I have a Metro 500. What does that mean when I say 500 as my argument, Robert? 500 milliseconds? Yeah, 500 milliseconds, okay. So we want to go ahead and collect, connect this so that it's, we can turn it on and off. 
And if I connect it to a bang button, I should be able to turn this on and I could get a nice flashing bang button every half a, mil half a second, okay? Are we able to do that? This should be a piece of cake after doing the tutorials. Is anybody behind on this? No, yes, speak now. Okay, so after you've got your Metro 500, I'm going to turn it back off, okay, and flip back over to my chart here. I've got an object called counter. Did anybody encounter this? No pun intended, but anybody <laughs> encounter this in the tutorials? The counter object and know what it does? I hear no obvious consensus, but nobody's speaking up. So it either, counts the number of bangs. yeah, it counts the number of bangs. So why would we be interested in defining rhythm in something that's actually going to count bangs? Because we've got that beats per measure. We have a certain amount of clicks. Yeah, beats per measure, or uh, just yeah, in terms of how meter is defined in music, right? Okay. No matter how much music theory you've uh, you've studied before, uh, we've all counted along to a song going one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, uh, and four being the most common grouping in Western music, right? Uh, other forms of music use other beat counts, basically, uh, in other non-Western traditions. Okay, so we've got the counter that can count one, two, three, four, and if we hook up a number box to this, what you'll see when you turn it on now is that it's just simply going to count 1 through 4. Okay. So, once you've got that in place, it's a matter of what do you do with those numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. So, we've gone from bangs, which are I don't know. Uh, let, me, let me put some comments in here. This is like every pulse, right? Is what this bang represents. This specifically is which pulse, right? Because now we've gone from. I, I don't care. It's it's not that I. I mean, I do care whether there's a pulse or not, but I want to know which pulse I am using within a given rhythmic cycle. Okay. Uh, typically, we talk about bars, right? Bars and beats in terms of music. Uh, that's the terminology that's used by a lot of DAWs, okay? Uh, but we've gone from from tracking every pulse to tracking which pulse. So now we can start to differentiate th from them, okay? The question then is how do we do that? And the easiest way to do that is with the select object, which you can type as select, but you can also abbreviate as just SEL. I'll go ahead and spell it out just for clarity's sake. Um, go ahead and just instantiate the select object and open up the help patch. Tell me what the select object does, Monica. Um, it does output things based on input matches. Okay. So I set up an argument that defines what? Anyone or Monica or anyone or Michael? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want to select, whatever you want to match, is the argument you give select. Okay. And not only can you give it one argument, you can actually give it multiple arguments, and it will grow the number of outlets for matching. Okay. And so what you'll see here is that I can now say select. 1, space 2, space 3, space 4. I connect that to my number box and then add a series of bang buttons. Connect those to my outlets. And I don't want to gloss over this too quickly, but you see as you float over to the outlet, it's going to tell you bang if output matches, and then whatever that last thing is, is the argument that it's trying to match to. So you see how here it says bang if output matches three? That is variable, so just to prove my point here. In 
bang if input matches in. Okay. So whatever I put as an argument, that's what it's going to try to match to. So if I type select space one, space two, space three, space four, okay, lock my patch and turn this on, everybody see what I get? Any questions up to this point? Does this make sense? Yeah. So in what? One, uh, you know, well, I could even exclude the, the bang here and the, the number box here. In one, two, three objects, basically, I've gone from every pulse to being able to uh, trigger specific pulses. Okay? And I can do various things with this. So let me slide this over. So what if I wanted to... I don't know. Let me use my imagination here, which sometimes is dangerous. All right? If I want to attach these to MIDI note numbers, MIDI note or pitch numbers, I should say, based to be ex exclusive. Okay. So this is now a a major triad. I'll get to pitch in a minute, but I just want to show you. Uh, what I can do here, okay. I now connect this to an easy DAC, not an easy A DAC, but an easy DAC, okay. And I'm going to connect the cycle object, okay. And do an MTOF. I connect these. So everybody should understand what's going on in the, the the right half of my patch is all synthesis. This is all stuff that we've covered, right? So there's no there's especially after project one, there shouldn't be any mystery about what's happening over here on the right side of my patch. Okay. If I turn on this DAC and start clicking these buttons, turn it up. Great, I got a nice major triad, okay. But now, if I want to connect that with the left half of my patch, which is my algorithmic engine, okay, I can do this. Feel free to go ahead and yeah, do this and connect it in your patch, okay? But basically, I've just built a little arpeggiator. Yes, actually it would. Good question. Do this. Uh, I, that's what I want. Yeah, so if I type in 200. Okay. Ah, okay. So follow, oh, follow okay. the logic here. Yeah, so this is beat one, this is beat two, this is beat three, this is beat four. Beat two is going to 64, and beat four is going to 64. So that's what gives me that up and then down movement. So it's actually going 60, 64, 67, then back to 64, then 60. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay, this is congratulations. These are like baby steps into algorithmic composition. Okay, the idea that we can have it generate an arpeggio on the fly. Okay, um, now I mean there's a couple. So uh, Colby asked, mentioned like, okay, well, if I start manipulating this number, can I get it to go faster? Yes. Where are some other places where I can manipulate the numbers and get different outputs? Well, you can change the uh, text here by changing. To three instead of four. Okay, yeah, I could change this to three. And now, oh, well, I'll turn it on. Maybe I should slow it down so you can actually hear it. Okay. Good, so I can manipulate the count, how high I'm counting here. 
What else could I manipulate? The direction of the counter, yeah. Okay, I could go up and then down. Do you have it up in another bang where you click and it goes down an octave? Ah, okay. So I could start to manipulate these numbers of pitch, right? So I can make changes here. Okay? You're starting to see places where you can start to make... I mean, uh, an arpeggio is pretty simple, but there's... Hopefully you're seeing places where you can start to make changes and make it more nuanced, more complicated, more robust. Okay? And... You know, what if I don't want this hardwired? What if I don't want to hardwire it to a C major triad? If I want to have a triad where I can just simply tell it the, the, the triad that should be playing, okay? I can start to do that sort of stuff. So this is, I mean, this is a basic starting point for algor algorithmic composition, okay? Um, let me see. Let me make sure I save this so I don't lose it. I mean, I've built it plenty of times, but uh, la, 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 la. Slides, new folder, week, 6A. <laughs> okay, so I got my arpeggiator saved. Yeah, you don't need to sign, it doesn't have to be no, a sign. Yeah. Okay, so that's counting rhythm. Okay, so there's other things we can do here. So uh, let's see, I, you guys have mentioned a few things that we could do. Uh, we could have other subdivisions of the pulse. So you could, uh, Aiden mentioned shortening it to three, but there's no reason we couldn't expand it to 16, right? And then start to, so uh, let's see here. Go back to my patch. Take this. Notes by putting, by just you know, not putting those orders. Yeah, writing one, six, nine, and having mm -hmm. rests. Yeah. So rhythm can Yeah, so I can do, uh, let's see. Yeah, so if I don't want there to be something on this beat, basically, I can delete it, delete the connection, okay? The other thing I do, if I d make it a little smaller, okay, you might want to try this out. So rather than this, what if I instead said gate? Do you guys know the gate object? If not, you might want to get to know it. Okay. The gate object. Anybody open up the help patch to let me know what gate does? Eric, I haven't heard from you yet today. What's, what does gate do? signal and that depending on if it has the input, it will mm -hmm. send one signal out and keep the other one in place. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's well, think of it just in terms of its name. What does a gate do uh, when you've got a gate in the fence? Yeah, uh, Colby. It closes like yeah. the same thing in terms of like mixing and stuff, that kind of gate? Uh, no, this is, this is not audio gating. But yeah, uh, uh, although well, I mean that there is some uh, connection by analogy there. But this is just a, this is a lot more coarse than audio gate uh, in terms of dynamic range processing. Um, this is basically letting a signal through, it, through or not through, basically open or the the simplest way to use it is open or close. Okay, and a zero and one configuration will let you <laughs> open the gate or close the gate. Okay. So you could uh, set it up so that on certain beats you can actually, rather than having to re-patch the connections, you could actually use the gates to interactively open and close them. Uh, you could then connect it to like your preset object, which many of you used in your, your projects, right? And you could have different preset rhythmic patterns, okay? Um, okay. Uh, so there's that. So, uh, so, uh, so subdivision of the pulse, uh, larger... Uh, range of pulses. Um, having related pulses, uh, so I could do something where, uh, let's do it this way. Right now I've got both, I've got my cycle going to both channels, but what if I did this and I had a secondary pulse over here. Let's see. Do, do, do. 
And I just copied this. I'm going to get rid of this gate for now. You know, what if I had a pulse driving both sides? Yeah, I got two arpeggios. Well, depending on when you start your first bang with the toggle, they'll be in sync or out of sync. Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna connect them up exactly the same way, but I'll set. And here, if I just in case you wanna synchronize these, you can have one. Excuse me, I didn't want it to be that big. There we go. So I got one on-off switch up here. I got this one set to 200. I got this one set to 500. If I turn this on, and then turn this on. If you can hear that. And you plug in. So the fact that they're independent pulses, right? I get kind of uh, a cannon with each other, basically. Okay, and if I want to really, uh, I can actually connect these toggle switches to the easy deck so it turns both on. Okay. Okay, so you see how you can have, actually, you can have multiple pulses going on inside the patch independent of each other, okay. Um, Independent pulses. Ah, chance of beat occurrence. So this deserves a little bit uh, uh, of an explanation. Okay, the biggest concept here is that uh, that we have where we start from. Okay, um, and this is I guess me introducing some of the pseudo random number generator stuff that I didn't get to introduce in the last uh, for the last project. Basically, uh, everybody repeat after me. There's no such thing as truly random. Okay. In computer terms, uh, Leo, you're, you've taken computer science class. It's always what? It's not random number generators. It's what's the prefix that we use? <laughs> I put you on the side. Okay, pseudo random number generators. Okay, um, in mathematical, you can't just tell a computer, "Hey, give me a random number." Okay, it doesn't know how to do that. But you can define a mathematical process that will give the appearance of random outputs over time. Okay, that's what a pseudo random number generator is. But underneath the surface, there's always a mathematical formula that defines the random behavior, and it's dependent on uh, input, both the well, let's see, the input, the output, and the seed. Okay. Um, uh, the the main idea here is that if you use the same seed, you actually will get the same series of numbers every time. Okay even though it's a random, quote unquote, mathematical engine, okay? So it's going to appear random, the sequence of numbers, but if you seed that mathematical formula with the same seed, it's going to actually produce the same series of numbers every time, okay? Um, that's a key distinction. There are, some, there are some computer music artists, that, I mean, well, I mean, let's say, if we're using our random number generation to define melodies, right? Why would I want to maybe get the same random sequence every time, which sounds really weird to say, the same random sequence every time? What, what's the function of melody in music? In terms of me your memory of music? Uh, the main part is what you remember. Yeah, it's what you remember, right? And if it's random every time, are you going to be able to hum that tune walking down the street? No, right? Okay. Um, or you're a computer music artist and you're, you're, you're developing stuff in your studio and you're going to take it to the club and you want to be able to play your hit song for everybody. If it's a random melody every time, is, everybody, is anybody going to recognize the music? No, right? Okay. So you may want to generate a random melody once and have it repeat so that it becomes recognizable. Okay. So there's, there's things that are random once, just for the first time, and then there are things that are random every time. Okay, So be aware that you have a choice. It's still random, it's just that you're seeding it the same way every time. Okay, So that you get that melodic function of memory, being able to recall the memory. Okay, um, So uh, let's talk about random number generators in Max. Uh, there are uh, a number of, on the, of them on the MSP side of things, but the ones I want to focus on uh, today, the last one is not strictly a 
uh, a random number generator, but random, earn, and drunk. Uh, let's see. Can we do it this time? I, I usually like to divide up the room and have people look at it. So you, Leo, Eric, Aiden, you guys look at random. Chris, Monica, Michael, you guys look at earn. Eric and Robert, you look at drunk. Open up that object, take 30 seconds to read the help patch, and then come back and tell me what it does. Yeah, you're telling, what, you're raising your hand to tell me already, or? No. I didn't give you one. Random. random. Oh. You're a random. <laughs> if I really wanted to, I would have built a random patch to randomly assign which object you were. That's maybe a little too extreme. So instantiate the object you were just given and look at the help patch. Yeah, you already looked at it? Yeah. Okay. So let me, let's just take them in order first. Wait, give everybody a chance to look at it. Okay, so somebody in this three, who can tell me what random does? Outputs random numbers within the range between zero and one less than the argument specified. Zero and one less than the argument specified. Maybe I'll go ahead and start a new patch at this point. Do, 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 do. Random. Okay. Zero and one, and there's that seed again right there. Okay. So the thing I was mentioning about having a seed, you can actually send a message to the random object to seed it so that it generates the same random sequence again. Okay. Again, if you're dealing with melody, that might be a desirable trait Would to actually have it generate this. What now? Yeah, it will. Yeah, so here, if, I, if I'm using just the help patch here, okay, I'm clicking and I'm generating a random number, okay, see these numbers down at the bottom, they're, they're more or less random. If I seed it, I should get 37, 23, 30, okay, seed it again, 37, 23, 30, seed it again, 37, tw 23, 30, everybody see that? Okay. So that, that's important to understand that we're not dealing with, it, it's never really a random number generator. It's a pseudo-random number generator, okay? Uh, so that's what random does. You define the range here in the argument, and it's always going to be between 0 and 1 less than that, okay? So there's that. Um, can you specify, like, do you from 40 to 45? Not with arguments, but how might you do So Leo's question is a good question. If I want to go not from 0 to 45, but I want to actually define a range that is from 40 to 45, how might I do that? Yeah. So if I know the range is from 40 to 45, okay, that's a range of 5. I can then add 40. I can actually make this bigger. There we go. And now I have a random number generator that's going to be between 40 and 45. OK? So what was next? You guys had earn back there? Tell us about earn, somebody. Random numbers without duplicates. OK? So that was one thing that didn't uh, enter into this. It's complete in a description of random. It's completely possible for the random object to generate two consecutive numbers that are exactly the same. Whereas the urn does not duplicate anything until you hit clear. Okay? It's what's known as the difference between random with replace and random without replace. So think of it this way. If I have a deck of cards, right? Everybody's familiar with cards, right? Card games, ace, queen, king, okay, all that sort of stuff, okay? Um, if I say pick a card to Leo and he pulls out the, the two of clubs, okay, if he keeps that card, what's the chance then that if I go to Colby, he, uh, he pulls out a card, is he going to be able to pull the two of clubs out of the deck? No, because Leo still has the card over here. Okay, I haven't cleared it, okay? If instead... You know, Leo picks the two of clubs. He put. I tell him put it back in the deck. I go back to Colby. There's a chance that Colby could actually pull the two of clubs out of the deck because we replaced that card into the deck. Okay, that's the difference between earn. Earn is the not replacing the card back into the deck, 
um, random is replacing the card back into the deck. You could get a duplicate. So you, so if you were to have a signal, it could eventually stop just because of it Yes, and in fact, here's our earn 10, seven. yeah. So I'll make it bigger here. Mm -hmm. Bang. I'll make earn 10. And there's actually this, what's called an overflow outlet here that gives you a bang when it's run out of numbers. Yeah. So if I hit this 10 times, you should never see the same number twice. And then when I, when I run out of numbers, this happens. <laughs> Okay. And you got a choice. You could do something else at that point, or you could clear it and generate another set of random numbers. Yeah. Did you hook it up to where it, instead of like flashing with the uh, switch, would you be able to like hook it up to a clear? Mm -hmm. You could do this. Yeah. This effectively does what you're after. Okay. Now, one note. When you do this clear bang, you could potentially, if the last number is 9, there's a potential that the first number out of the next set could be 9, which may or may not be desirable. So be aware of that. Because once you reset it, it doesn't have a memory of the, the previous condition. Okay. And so there's, uh, there's people that have built uh, versions and variations of urn so that it prevents even that from occurring. But where's one, I don't know, uh, Eric, I know you've taken through theory four, right? So where's an instance where we might want to uh, generate random numbers without replacing them? Basically. Yeah, 12-tone 12 12 music, tone. right? Yeah, the wow. serialism, right, where we want to use all the pitches in a chromatic scale before moving on, right? Okay, so urn is tailor-made for doing that sort of stuff, okay? So if you, uh, yeah, it, it, I've often joked that, you know, this theory four would be much easier if you could first learn max programming. You could actually program max to do your See, homework like before you basically. Two. Anyway, theory two? The whole note scale and stuff? No, no, no. Chromatic, chromatic 12, 12 tone squares. Yeah. Yeah. That's theory two? Theory two. Okay, good. <coughs> Get it early. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> drunk. What does drunk do, Robert or Eric? to uh, change by step, which can either be it can suppress duplicates or it can include them. Mm -hmm. So this idea of what's known as a random walk, is there anything to elaborate on that, Robert, or do you? No? Okay. So it's tough. It can't jump from a thousand to one if you have it steps by five, so it stays somewhat constant for the most part. Yeah, it's what's known as Brownian motion. I'm clicking this as about as. Oh, I guess it's a metro. I don't have to do that. Duh. <laughs> Silly me. Okay. So you see how it kind of moves randomly up and down, but it stays kind of in a general tendency. Yeah, and so if I took this, let's see. Whoa, not that. This and that. Copied it and went back over to my other patch here. Oh. Maybe I'll do it this way. MTOF cycle copy. Hey, there you are over there. Oh, yeah. Just to sonify this rather than graphing it. Oh, that other patch is still running. Uh -huh. Turn this on. See, there you go. Okay. It's like a bebop engine. You know bebop. <laughs> Okay. You can see it does your beat song and stays on like a second longer. Yeah. And so these are, uh, I can close this, don't save. 
So these are different ways to generate random numbers in Max. Okay. Um, random, earn, drunk. Why include a less than symbol? Well, let's go back to our patch. Oh, the one that I closed. Awesome. Uh, let's see here. Save as. This is our PRNGs. And then I'm going to close that. I'm going to open up my recent ARP1. I'm going to save it as ARP2. Okay. Now, uh, if I go back to my pulse, and then I say, let me think. Think how I want to do this. I don't want. To, I think I want to remove pitch from the equation just so that it's everybody understands what I'm doing here. So I guess this isn't going to be an arpeggiator. I'm going to instead. I've got a metro object. I've got every pulse. So rather than counting it, I'm going to move that to the side here. I'm going to create. Okay. A random number between. So what if I say random 100? What's that going to generate numbers between? 0 and 99, okay? So if I hit bang on this so that I'm generating a random number every time every pulse, okay? And I let's see. input that to my less than object. I'm going to go ahead and say less than 0 by default, but I'm going to include an integer What this allows me to do is say, okay, right now I've got it less than zero, so I'm going to get 100% of the pulses. But watch what happens when I say 20. Making a liar on me. Come on now. Let's see here. Maybe it helps if I do well. Take this and put it next to this. You can see as I gradually increase this. Okay, why am I not getting? Wait a minute now. Something's wonky here. I should be getting none of the pulses right now. Oh, you know what? Hey, look at that. I need to put a select in here. Silly me. Because it's either going to be... it. This doesn't output a bang. It outputs a true or a false. One or zero. And I want to know if it's true. Uh, I guess I need to... Let's see here. Yeah, there we go. Now I'm getting it. See, I'm getting a certain percentage. What this lets me do is say, I want forty-four percent of the pulses. Okay. And so, one process you can do for generating random uh, rhythms is to say. Give me 20% of the pulses. Give me 30% of the pulses and put this instrument on 40% of the pulses over here, basically. So you can do that. Uh, you can also put this little circuit uh, uh, down here. So we get 100% of the downbeats, but only 20% of this beat 2, and 50% of beat 3, but only 20% of beat 4. So does that make sense? Okay, so you see how that I've, I've kind of combined those two ideas of a random number generator using a less than symbol. I can actually create a, a, a chance operation, if you will. I only want 20% of these beats. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what I wanted to show you there. Uh, and if I want to sonify this. Well, uh, Easiest way for me to sonify this would be to say, click. Oh, not that.
Let me delete this. Okay, it's not the most uh, uh, captivating musical example, basically, but I wanted to give you some sense of what this sounds like versus what it looks like, hearing 44% of the pulses versus hearing 100% of the pulses. Okay, see how you could use that as an algorithmic parameter? Okay. Um, what, what could that be applied to, though? Like, I, I can't imagine, like, a drum... Well, I mean, I am, I'm basically creating rhythms by saying, give me 40% of the beats. Apply it you want. Yeah, you can apply it to whatever you want. Because even if it only plays 40% of the beats, let's see here. I'm still doing this in my head. Okay. See what I'm saying? So now I start to hear it as rhythms. Okay. Um, let's turn this off. Let's go back to my slides here. Okay, so that's pseudo-random generators and max. Uh, I'm looking at the time. Okay, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce pitch to you before I give you your groups, but I'm probably going to have to recap pitch at the beginning of class on Thursday because I'll have to go through it like so fast that you're going to go like, what? Um, okay. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the topic of pitch and pitch representations and how we can start to manipulate those things. Um, but I'll recap it at the beginning of class on Thursday, okay? So just to give you that heads up. So let's talk about the chromatic scale, right? Okay. We typically talk about these in terms of, if you're not familiar with traditional music notation, okay? We typically talk about this in terms of the scale degree. Being, we start with C. Okay. Um, we can talk about it in terms of being scale degree 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then we get back to C again, which should be the same thing, which should be scale degree 1. Okay. It is far more beneficial, instead of talking about these in terms of scale degrees, to instead talk about them in terms of half steps above the tonic when we're dealing with algorithmic composition. So instead of thinking about this as being the first scale degree, think of it as being zero half steps above the tonic, one half step, two half steps, etc., on up to 11. And the nice thing is when you add 12, you're at the new octave. Okay? So everybody with me so far? Okay. So I like to think about this in terms of it being a clock face. It's a lot... For me, I'm spatial. I like to see it in a circle and think about it in terms of it's a nice connection with a the clock. There's 12 hours, 12 half steps, okay? Um, it's very easy to use this clock face to define musical uh, pitch structures. I'm trying to use a, a very broad, all-encompassing term, okay? And by pitch structures, I mean scales and chords, okay? So rather than thinking of it as being G, C, or uh, let's see, no, C, E, G as being defining a C major triad, you can start to think of it as how do I create a major triad in terms of half steps above the tonic, okay? And it becomes a lot more useful in terms of algorithmic composition when you do that, okay? So think about this in terms of, when I say diatonic scale, I mean a major scale, okay? Um, when I... Those of you that know music theory, how would we define a, a major scale using half steps above the tonic? Everybody remember their whole step, half step, whole step, whole step. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, so a whole step is really two half steps, right? So a, whole, a, a major scale, you start with zero, it's what? C to D is a whole step, so you, you go to two. D to E is a whole step, so you go to four. E to F is a half step, so you go to five. Five, then you go to seven, which would be a half, so you go a half step up to G. G to A is a whole step, so you go to nine. Then A to B is a whole step, and it leaves you a half step before you come back to C again. Okay, so defining pitch structures. Everybody see what I'm doing here in terms of how I'm defining pitch structures? It's a different way of thinking about scales and chords 
but it's extremely useful for how you can represent these structures inside the computer. Okay, so this is a major scale in using this clock face uh, notation. Okay, I can do the same thing with um, uh, chords and such. But if I take this, sorry, my animation get it again here. Okay, if I take these numbers and jot them down, okay, and put them in a list like this, okay, I now have a a nice computer represent computer friendly representation of a major scale. Okay, half steps above the tonic, and the nice thing it, with it being in this format is I can then manipulate things like what is the tonic. You know, it's very easy to take this and say, okay, now make it a C major scale. Okay, now make it an F major scale. Okay, now make it a G major scale. Okay, the way you do that is by simply saying, okay, I, I want the second scale degree. Okay, so you look in your list and you tell the computer now start from 0, 1, 2. Okay, well, the second scale degree is four half steps above the tonic. Okay, if my computer knows that the tonic is C sharp, it can add four half steps to it and get the appropriate pitch for two scale degrees up. Everybody see how that works? So based on two pieces of information, how the scale is structured and what the tonic is, I can always get the right pitch for the various scale degrees. Okay? Make sense? I can then manipulate this by saying, okay, now I want the fourth scale degree. I just go back to my list, look up, it's ha seven half steps above the tonic. I add that to my tonic and out pops the proper pitch. Okay? If I instead change the scale, so I go from a major scale to a minor scale. Everybody see the difference there? I lower these two uh, steps here, right? Okay? So I change the scale structure by lowering two of the pitches in terms of the number of half steps. The nice thing is now my computer still asks for the fourth scale degree. I've changed the representation of the scale, so it still outputs the proper pitch. So I can build a system that is not dependent on any one scale. It's dependent, it's flexible enough that I can input any scale that I want and get the proper pitch out. See where I'm going with this? I, I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture for you of some sort of, of a meta algorithmic composition engine where I can change the scale at will. Okay. I can also change the tonic at will. I just tell it, well, I now I want to add to an F as my tonic rather than a C sharp. And when I ask for the second scale degree again, it outputs the proper pitch. Are you able to get, wrap your head around this? Okay. Um, these sorts of structures are very useful and uh, I guess are a good generic way of describing these things for computer interaction and computer programming, okay? And we're going to get into how to do that with Max in the coming class, okay? So I will recap that first, that last section next class, and then we'll dive right into how to do that inside of Max, okay? But I promised I would give you your groups before you leave here today, okay? These are your new groups. You're divided into two groups of four, so uh, make sure everybody knows each other. Uh, Michael, Colby, Robert, Aiden, raise your hands. Three of you there, and Robert's over there, okay? And the rest of you, Monica, Eric, Leo, and Chris, raise your hands real quick. Just make sure everybody knows each other, okay? So you want to take some time to make sure you've got everybody's information before you leave here, okay? Um, so you know who's in your group. Uh, and this is where we're going, basically. I don't know. Can I... Based on your reading of the chapter, is there someone that feels strongly that, like, I'm going to do, I'm totally going to do stochastic aleatory stuff over here, and that's, that's what I want our group to focus on, or I totally want to do generative stuff? Not no? Really biased. What? Not really biased. Not really biased? I'd like to do generative. You'd like to do generative? So, Michael's group, are you okay with me pushing you toward this side? Sure. Saying, let's say, be clear. This is a soft boundary this time. You're free to pilfer topics from the other side of the graph on this project, okay? You're not strictly stuck in a certain half of the project, okay? But in general, it'd be nice to have one group covering generative processes and working at it from a generative framework, 
the other group looking at a stochastic framework, okay, and chance and aleatory, that sort of stuff, which are variations on the same idea, okay. Um, so I've already co I've covered kind of like pulse and rhythm stuff, basics of that. I've started covering pitch class set stuff, and it's not really that hard to see how this stuff translates into how to deal with stress and inflection. But stress, I mean like accented and unaccented beats, that sort of thing. Um, I also will probably throw in a little bit of a primer on Markov, uh, Markovian mathematics, just because they, and they, they result in some nice things. Okay, um, so that'll be like a bonus topic where I'll throw in basically. Um, you're responsible for researching these techniques building an algorithmic engine that drives your synthesis patches from the first project and describing the processes that you have at work, basically. How you strung them together, how you, where the, the historical and technical derivations of those techniques are, okay? Uh, and I probably won't, I'm trying to think, in my slides of Markov, I don't think I cover much of the history, so if anybody does use Markov stuff, you're free to like fill in some of the historical details, okay? But Take the last five minutes here and talk to your groups. Get a game plan on because your annotated bibliographies are due in one week. one week, okay? And your presentation is in two weeks. So start talking. And let me know if you have any other comments or questions before you leave.